Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. When we're facing a difficulty, often just knowing that there's an end point to that challenge will help us persevere. And along those same lines, God has told His people just how long their punishment would last so that they would persevere in the midst of their trials. Well, hello, my name is Russ Brewer, pastor of Wanting Community Church, and you're listening to our daily podcast that is going through the key chapters of the Bible. Now, one of the reasons for this entire study is a lot of times we struggle to understand large chunks of our Bible. We might have a handle on a few books here and there, but there might be whole parts of Scripture that we're just not familiar with. And my hope for this podcast is that by taking a chapter each day and focusing on what that passage has to say and how it fits into the overall message of the Word of God, we'll not only understand what that passage is saying, but we'll also understand what the overall book is saying and how that whole book is just moving the message of God forward to us. And so that means that there are times we'll come to a key chapter that may not seem very exciting or very important, but it's actually crucial for us to understand so that we can understand the message of the rest of the Bible. And that's the case with Jeremiah 25. Now, if you've just read this chapter, I'm pretty sure you haven't found a whole lot of potential life verses in this chapter. This is not the kind of chapter we just love to read and study because it's filled with things that we're maybe not very familiar with. And yet, chapter 25 was vital to the Jews and was even referred to by Daniel in the book of Daniel chapter 9. We're going to look at that in a few minutes as well. And I hope in all of this, we'll find that this relatively obscure passage is vital to the history of the Jews, as well as helping us understand God's trustworthiness when he makes a promise in his prophecies. And so let's dive into chapter 25, starting in verse 1. Verse 1 gives us the time frame of when this chapter happened. Uh, Verse 1 says, Jeremiah was writing this prophecy in the fourth year of King Jehoiakim. Now, Jehoiakim only reigned for 11 years, starting in 609 BC. And so if this is the fourth year, then this is something like 605 BC. Now, that's about 19 years before the complete Babylonian exile begins. However, we need to remember that the fall of Judah came in three phases, And by this point, the first phase has already happened. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But before we do, let's look at verse 3. In verse 3, Jeremiah reminds the people that he has been proclaiming God's judgment upon them and warning them of God's coming judgment for 23 years. For 23 years, he has been faithfully telling the people about God's holiness, his righteous standards, and the coming judgment that they're going to face because they have broken their covenant with God. If you think about it, we have only been going through the book of Jeremiah for a little over a week, and it feels like it's just unrelenting messages of judgment. Imagine how this would have felt for these folks for 23 years. Now, you'd think that they would get the message after 23 years, but they haven't. And so in verse 4, Jeremiah is talking about how they didn't listen to him. They didn't incline their ears to hear what he has to say. In fact, they have done the opposite of what he has called them to do. In verse 5, he said, turn from your evil ways and your evil deeds, but instead they went further into wickedness. In verse 6, he said, don't go after other gods, but instead idolatry flourished during these years. Now, in all of this, they thought they were cheating fate, but they were not. And so Jeremiah says that in verse 8, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send and take all of the families of the north, declares the Lord. And so the Lord is just telling them he's going to be bringing this judgment upon them. Now, what's it going to look like? Well, verse 9 goes on to say, And I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against all of these nations round about. And so the Lord is bringing Nebuchadnezzar on down to bring judgment upon them. Now, it's interesting here because Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. He was this rising star in the region. And here he's being called a servant of the Lord, and he's going to be the one who is bringing judgment and destruction upon this whole region. Now, if you look at verse 11, and verse 11 is a key verse in this chapter, it says, This whole land will be a desolation and a horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And so this is a key verse in this chapter because it tells us the length of this coming judgment. Now, why was it 70 years? Well, this is not an arbitrary number. It was related to the number of years that the Jews were in the land and the number of Sabbaths they failed to observe. We mentioned this briefly in our study in Jeremiah 17, where we mentioned how Jeremiah's prophecy was quoted in 2 Chronicles 36, verse 21, about how the exile was coming because they were violating the Sabbath laws. And so God is warning these folks all along that he was going to be bringing judgment upon them for not obeying the Sabbath. But this shouldn't have been a surprise to them because all the way back in Leviticus 26, the Lord had been warning his people about the danger of being exiled because of their disobedience to the Sabbath. 
let's turn our Bibles over to Leviticus 26 here and look at verse 33. I'll give you a moment to turn there or you can pause the podcast if you need to. It's kind of a longer passage. We're going to be reading Leviticus 26, 33 to 35. It says, You, however, I will scatter among the nations and will draw out a sword after you as your land becomes desolate and your cities become waste. Then the Lord will enjoy its Sabbaths all the days of the desolation while you are in your enemy's land. Then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbath. All of the days of its desolation, it will observe the rest which it did not observe on your Sabbath while you were living on it. And so it's critical to see here that the Lord is saying, throughout the time that you lived in this land, you were violating the Sabbath laws and the total accumulation of all of the Sabbaths they had violated adds up to 70 years. Now, you'll remember, let's talk about Sabbaths for a moment. You'll remember that the people of God were supposed to take every week a day of rest, a Sabbath rest. But in addition to that, every seventh year, they were to observe a sabbatical year or a Sabbath year. And these would be times when they were to let the land rest. Uh, They weren't to work the land. Now, if the land produced food on its own, naturally, they could go and eat that. But they couldn't work the land. Along with that, during this time, all debts would be forgiven and Hebrew slaves would be released. And so this would be a time of tremendous trust and just having to really just trust and believe in the Lord for him to provide what they needed. But apparently, this trust was too much for them because they hardly ever, if ever, observed the sabbatical years. And so that's where that 70-year number comes from. All of these Sabbaths that they missed totaling together equals 70 years. But we also need to understand the time frame of the 70 years of the exile. Because if we just start with what the classic time of the exile is from 586 BC, and then we look to the first return in 537 BC or 538 BC, the numbers don't add up. But if you remember from our study in the book of Kings and Chronicles, there were three waves of, of this deportation. There's three waves to the fall of Judah, and the fall involves two different nations, Egypt and Babylon. In many ways, their fall actually began in 609 BC when Josiah was killed by the Egyptians and they set up Jehoiakim as their vassal king. Now, Jehoiakim was technically the king, but he was under Egypt's authority. And you actually see this common theme throughout the book of Jeremiah, where Jeremiah is rebuking the leaders, rebuking the people for putting their trust in Egypt to protect them and to provide for them. We even saw that all the way back in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 18. And so for a few years, Egypt is basically ruling over the people of Judah. But then comes along Nebuchadnezzar in 605 BC, and he takes out Egypt and he takes control over Judah. And in 605 BC, you have that first deportation taking place. And that's when you have Daniel and a lot of Daniel's friends were all being deported during that time. And so the exile began actually in 605 BC, and it was completed in 586 BC. And so when you factor all of that on in to when does the exile begin and when does the exile end, It's pretty common for people to say that the exile began in 605 BC with the first deportation and it ended around 536 BC when the first wave of the Jews came back and rebuilt the temple. And that's about 70 years and the remaining difference is then made up by just recognizing that these events happened midway through calendar years. And so you just can make up that other year through that way as well. And so with all of that, we need to know that the Lord had told his people through Jeremiah that the exile would last for 70 years. Now, on the one hand, uh, this was, for many people, something of a death sentence because that meant they were going to be dying in Babylon. But for other people, it also meant that they would have hope that they would be able to return to the promised land. Now, we'll get to that in just a moment. The rest of this chapter, chapter 25, just concludes with just God's wrath being poured out upon the nations. And he's got this cup of wrath that he's pouring out upon them. And and all of that, just an impressive array of, of God's judgment. But rather than focusing on that, I want to focus for a moment on how this 70-year prophecy affected God's people. And we see how it affected them directly in the book of Daniel, chapter 9. So let's turn our Bibles over to Daniel, chapter 9. Now, as you're turning there, Daniel was deported during the first deportation in 605 BC. And so he is looking at that, and you can even just get the sense that he's looking at that and saying, okay, Jeremiah says it's going to be 70 years. It's about 70 years, and he starts doing all the math and figuring it out. And we see this over in Daniel chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Verse 1 sets up the context. It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, and it's kind of a hard name right there, uh, of Midian descent, who was made king over the kingdom of, of the Chaldeans. And so, pausing for a second, Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, who I'm having a hard time saying his last name, Darius became king in 539 BC or maybe 538 BC. He only reigned for two years. And so we still have Cyrus coming pretty quick. 
But during those two years, when he takes up his reign, Daniel is very aware of the biblical clock that's ticking. And so he writes in Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. And so Daniel is looking through the word of God and he's going through Jeremiah and he is seeing the Lord's prophecies to Jeremiah that it would only be a 70 year captivity. And so look how he responds in verse three. In verse three, he writes, so I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth and ashes. Now, this is a great picture of how we should respond to the Lord's prophecies in general. Um, Daniel gave attention to the Lord God, as in he focused on the Lord and not on the things going on around him. And he sought the Lord with prayer. He brought his supplications to the Lord, his requests, his burdens. He spent time fasting, which shows that there was just nothing more important than this careful study of God's word to Daniel. And he did it in sackcloth and ashes. That's just an Old Testament way of showing a humble repentance before the Lord. And so what was he praying in all of this? Again, we're just looking at Daniel's response to this prophecy of 70 years. Well, he prays this long prayer here. It's too long for us to go into in depth. But look at verse 4. In verse 4, he says, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. And then in verse 5 and 6, he confesses his sins and the sins of the people. In verse 7, he extols the righteousness of the Lord, and he continues confessing their sins and calling upon the Lord to act throughout the rest of this prayer all the way down to verse 19. And so here we have an example of Daniel, one of God's servants, waiting for the Lord to act. And this is just an example for how we can respond as well. Because in many ways, we come to these prophecies and we look at all the prophecies about the end times or the return of Christ, And like Daniel, we can look around us and say, are these things beginning to set on up and come to pass? And just being watchful and aware. And so I wanted us to see in Daniel 9 here how a student of God's word comes to God's word as truth and even will make decisions of life because of God's word. And so that brings us to some practical applications for Jeremiah 25. For one thing, Jeremiah 25 shows us that God's judgment is not arbitrary. He has specific goals that he is seeking to accomplish. And if we ever face trials or ordeals, our task is to learn to trust the Lord in these times just to further galvanize our commitment to obeying him and worshiping him no matter what comes our way. Uh, We also know that our trials will come to an end. Uh, We may not know when they will come to an end, but God does. And so we can trust him because these trials, these challenges we face, they're not arbitrary. They're under the sovereign hand of God. And on that note, uh, going back to the beginning of this chapter, Jeremiah is so specific in this passage, in these prophecies, in these warnings, and yet the people thought they were immune from God's judgment. They figured either Jeremiah was wrong about the judgment or he was wrong about applying it to them. It didn't apply. They got to get out of jail card free. And the fact is, though, uh, they were not immune. God's judgment was going to fall upon them. Jeremiah's warnings were going to come to pass. And this is just an example that we should always take God's warnings seriously. Just think about the precision that we're seeing so far as we go through God's word. God gave his people warning after warning, prophecy after prophecy, and he still gives us warnings today. He calls us to walk with him, to obey him, to follow him. He's even warned us in passages like Hebrews 9, 27, that it's appointed for a person to die once and then comes judgment. And so we must take these warnings seriously. None of us are immune to them. We could be like the Jews of Jeremiah's day and say, you know what, I'm not going to listen. It doesn't apply to me. And yet it does. We all must repent before the Lord. We must all surrender to him before it's too late. Tomorrow is not guaranteed, but today can be the day of our salvation. And so may all of us listening to this podcast repent and align our life with God and his will. May we be like the faithful Jews looking to the Lord, waiting for his return. Well, we'll end our study in Jeremiah 25 there. Thanks for listening. I hope you have a great rest of your day. We'll catch you tomorrow. God bless.